Hello, in my Humanities 120 section uh, this spring, uh, one of our projects was to make a mural. And uh, the initial idea was to make a mural uh, recomposing the parts uh, or taking a big burrow that stands outside of Carnegie building on campus, cutting it up into quadrants and having students paint from life, that is with easels outside, sections of it. We put that off until later, uh, late spring, and now our class doesn't meet again in mid spring on campus. We put that off instead, we decided to copy Sheldon Tapley's Flowers in a Bohemian Face. This uh, oil uh, in colors uh, on an aluminum panel. This dates from 2000. It, uh, it's a period in which uh, Sheldon Tapley changed from working in pastels because his, he was wearing his fingers out to working in oils. So this is one of the first paintings uh, in that uh, period, beginning in 2000. It is, uh, it's almost an optical illusion. It looks like it's a vase of flowers. It is so colorful, so, uh, so precise in the lines of the petals and the tendrils, the vase. This uh, brick here, by the way, uh, sitting on this table with open doors, screams some sort of symbolism. The symbolism, in fact, that we can point out the, to attach to this brick is that it represents, the, in the tradition of still lifes, of human vanity and human mortality, it represents the skull. And in some of the other paintings that Sheldon Tapley has in the exhibit this spring, instead of the brick which uh, he's put on this table, we find a skull. So this was the inspiration for our painting. We did not do it in color, as you'll see shortly, and we'll explain why. The point I was making about the skull as a symbol of uh, human mortality uh, is uh, made evident in this uh, black and this charcoal uh, sketch. I don't even want to call it a sketch because it seems to me like a finished work by Tapley from 2001. 2001. And here's the skull. And in the painting that we copied, that we'll soon add on the outside, there's a brick here. We have the same table with the doors partly open. We have a base and we have uh, plant life. Another aspect of these paintings that is revealed in our copy, our, re our deconstruction of it, and our reconstruction of it in this mural outside, is the fascination that Sheldon Tapley has with striped cloth on the left-hand edge of his paintings, of his sketches. So that that cloth that you may have seen, that you saw in the original painting, the Flowers in the Bohemian Base, pops up here in 2000. 13, uh, 13 years later, it pops up as the dress for the model. So these uh, two aspects of the painting are made more uh, obvious by what we did with the mural. So uh, we've just been inside the Norton Center and we've seen the original painting that our mural has copied. And that will uh, help us understand some of what I have to say about this mural. I've divided up my brief lecture and I'll mention I don't lecture as uh, a way of teaching, uh, so you'll, you'll see that during this brief lecture. I've divided it up in about four parts. And initially, some, uh, you might call it the philosophical part, where I talk about the ideas, the motivation behind this mural. And then uh, I have a part that's primarily about people and materials. And we'll find out in that part you can't separate the people from the materials used to do this mural. And then maybe a final comment about the significance of the mural. So what does this mural do standing outside of the Norton Center? It, uh, it makes fun of the seriousness of art. That's what it does. It makes fun of the seriousness of art. Uh, it does something else, though. It also makes fun of the claim uh, that we can finish artworks and even human lives. It makes fun of the claim that lives can somehow be made whole and finished. And I think you'll see both of those uh, aspects illustrated in the mural. Uh, the philosopher, by the way, who put me onto this idea that uh, art is fundamentally radically playful is Immanuel Kant, whose uh, critique of the 
of judgment published in 1787 describes what he calls the purest form of human judgment, which is the judgment of the beautiful or the awesome or the awe-inspiring. Uh, and he divides up this kind of judgment into notions of subjectivity, that is an artwork, our, our judgment of it is highly subjective, it depends on you, it depends on me. It is universally uh, applicable, we claim it for everyone, not just for ourselves. It is uh, relational in the sense that it has something like a purpose. When we look at this mural, we look at Schopenhauer's painting, we discern something like a purpose, but we can't really make that specific or tie it down. And finally, there's something necessary about the kind of judgment that we make when we judge art and beautiful. That's the, in a nutshell, what uh, Emmanuel Kant has to say in the critique of judgment. Um, the other thinker who put me onto this, uh, who provides, you might say, the philosophical backdrop for this mural, is uh, Martin Heidegger in his work called Being in Time, which is published in 1927. Uh, in that work, Heidegger uh, makes, makes the point that we, that the human being is not a thing. We are not a substance, therefore we don't have the characteristics of substances, of things. Things can be completed, they can be made whole. Uh, a building can be completed so that it can be used for whatever purpose, like the Norton Center. But we stand apart from those kinds of being, the human being does, uh, in that we are never a project that is finished. We are always an ongoing project full of possibility. And that is what I find satisfying in uh, his thinking and in this mural. So those two thinkers are give me uh, a way to think about this mural. But it's, uh, you'll say to yourself, but surely this mural is a thing. It's uh, made of wood. It's got these four by four treated posts. It's got panels over which is painted black and white, acrylic. And it stands uh, some six feet observing social distance. It stands about six feet off the ground. It goes eight feet tall and eight feet wide. So it's a thing. But my my thought is that you can't separate the thing, the aspect of the mural, uh, from uh, the people involved in making it. And I have several groups of people that I want to recognize. Uh, you'll guess who some of them might be right off the bat, but several groups of people, groups I want to recognize. First of all, those who enabled this uh, mural to happen, and that's Steve Hoffman, the director of the Northern Center, uh, the president, John Rauch. Uh, quite indirectly, a colleague, Jenny Ballard, who teaches Spanish and humanities at Center, enabled this mural because we had simultaneously the idea of putting a billboard mural in front of the Olin Hall construction site. We had that idea simultaneously, and I decided to move away from that and move over to the North Center. So, oddly enough, Jenny, made, Jenny Ballard made that possible. Uh, I'm backing up still to people who made this possible, and I'm backing up a little further to Milton Riegelman, who told me uh, when I was looking for another place, uh, uh, apart from the Olin uh, Hall construction site, suggested that I have my students copy a painting by Sheldon Tapley, and his exhibit is in the North Center this spring 2020. So, and finally, of course, I have uh, Sheldon Tapley to thank for the, this mural, this mosaic pastiche version of his painting, because he smiled on the project. Um, so you can't think of the mural outside of, of these, these people. So the first people are colleagues. Uh, but I have almost forgotten another very important person, that is Clay Contini, who is in charge of the grounds career, who, and who came out here with his big blue lift and hoisted up these panels. We had already constructed the post, we'd already put the post in the, in the earth, uh, but he came out with a lift and with his crew hoisted them up and, and screwed them into the 16 foot long posts. The second people to be mentioned are the student artists of my Humanities 120 Section O, uh, uh, whose names figure on this sign. Uh, 22 students and two colleagues were probably finished it up. I just got a journal entry. Classes haven't begun, Center. As you know, we're going online. 
so my students will be doing journal entries, but I've already got a journal entry from Teresa, and she writes this, and I thought she wouldn't mind if I quoted some of what she says. And that's not about the mural, it's about herself, but it's impossible to separate them. She writes, uh, Tuesday, March 24th, she writes this, Right now in Boston, Massachusetts, the weather is consisting of cold and rain and ice everywhere. We just the day before it was sunny and nice out. New England as it is, is always being pretty bipolar. The governor just put out a stay-at-home advisory until April 7th. This means that literally everything from hair salons to corner stores have to close until further notice. As energetic as I am, it really is hard to be confined, but I'm always finding a way to enjoy myself. I walk, I work at a grocery store, so I'm really looking forward to being out of the house and socializing with my customers and co-workers. I've also noticed that the more time I spend at home, the more food I want to eat to accompany me with the boringness that I've been experiencing, even if I am not hungry. This is more of a reason for me to go back to work so that I don't spend all of my tax returns on food. Despite it all, I'm continuing to remain positive because sometimes you have to go through the worst of things in order to get to the best of things. I can't wait to hear that we can finally be out of isolation, businesses will be back open, and I can be fully released from jail. Well, this is the first, this is not the entire entry, but I think it's pretty poignant and evocative of the times we're now in. And so that was a message from Teresa. Created the materials on a Monday to take home with them, black and white acrylic paint, a panel that I had painted white. Uh, I gave them a photocopy after I had made a, a photograph of uh, Tapley's painting and cut it up into 24 quadrants. I gave them a hazy photocopy of the section, and I told them to go home and paint it and bring it back Wednesday, and that's what they did. So here's how the... Uh, prototype of the mural look. That is, I made a copy, a photograph of Tappy's painting and photocopied it and then divided it up into 24 parts. Uh, making that photocopy, by the way, gave me uh, this, initially this image of the painting, and it was then uh, that I began to panic about, you've seen the colors of the original painting, you've seen how vibrant and precise and lifelike the flowers are. By the way, those flowers were planted by Anne. They were, they were planted and cared for, brought up by Anne Silver, Sheldon Tapley's wife. So there are many anecdotes to uh, many, many, uh, the background to the painting, which is quite personal and quite interesting. But when I saw this one day, I said to myself, well, why don't we stop with this? Why don't we stop with black and white? It is within our means and it's attractive. And that's one of the reasons why we have uh, a mural now that stands in black and white and not in color. And it also helps us take, us, take our distance and, and express our humility vis-a-vis uh, -vis the original. Um, by the way, one of the things that comes out in doing this mural, one of the things that it reveals is the structure of the original. Because we unpacked it, as they like to say in literary criticism, we unpacked this mural and repacked it, put it back together, we did what they call deconstruction. We found out that this uh, cloth uh, hanging on the left-hand side is a fixation, it's a motif, it's a light motif in Sheldon Tapley's work. Inside we've seen some examples of uh, it turning, it morphing into clothing for a model, or it's uh, taking the shape of a, of a rope on the left-hand side. And so that became evident when my students did the cloth, and uh, one of my students sent me this in, in, uh, as, a, as a picture, an email, saying that he started to see the cloth uh, around him on campus because it looks a lot like the crosswalks <laughs> that we encounter. So it started to have an after image. I don't want to forget to mention how the symbolism of the painting, that is the skull which is turned into a brick, or the table which has open doors, or the face which is uh, standing and holding the flowers, how all of that symbolism gets pushed around in the mural that we did in the spring of 2020. Uh, it, it doesn't quite come together, it breaks up the symbolic tendency of the painting, you might say. But I told Sheldon and I told my students that all we did in our mural was to uh, take to extremes something that Sheldon Tapley had already started. When he put that uh, cloth on the left-hand side, striped cloth, 
and as a kind of a leitmotif of his paintings, he was beginning to take apart the tradition, the tradition of still lifes, of pointing to human mortality and human vanity. He was already taking that apart. And in our mural, when we took apart what he took apart, it made it even more obvious and extreme. So that's what we have here. We have the black and white version of this broken symbolism, you might say. The only, uh, the last thing I would say about this mural is that when you see it from 100 or 200 feet away at the corner of, of College Street and Walnut Street out there, it doesn't make much sense at all. Uh, my wife said that when she sees it, she doesn't see a vase of flowers, uh, she sees a court jester or a harlequin shape, and it has something to do with those flowers that are riotous, the, the crowd of flowers in the top of our mural. So uh, it, even at a distance, uh, and this is, this is a joke, because normally a painting like this, which is impressionistic or which is digitalistic or a mosaic-like painting, it, when it's seen in a great distance, it comes together and it makes sense. With well, this painting, the farther away you get from it, it, it makes even less sense than if you stand up close to it. So it, it pokes fun of that technique too.